Hello and welcome to MCA Services. In this video we're going to be presenting some background information to gas sorption analysis and we use this to investigate the porosity and the surface area of samples. We're going to consider the collection of gas adsorption and desorption isotherms and then we're going to show the information that we can gain from them. Finally we were going to go on to show the different parts of an isotherm and how we apply them to determining different pieces of information about the poor characteristics and also the various techniques we apply to this. Now you can find more information about all of these techniques and all of our analytical services on our website using the link below and in later videos we're going to expand on some of these themes a little bit further. We measure gas adsorption isotherms in order to investigate the porous nature and characteristics of a sample. For example, the pore size, the pore volume, and the pore area, as well as the surface area. This isn't intended to be a full tutorial on, on adsorption theory, but it really is useful to consider the basic adsorption process that occurs as we collect a, a gas adsorption and desorption isotherm, as it helps to understand the information we're going to go on to get from it. Although it's usual to describe this analysis as gas adsorption, we're actually referring to a process of physisorption, that's physical adsorption. And that is the interaction between adsorbing atoms, the adsorbate, and the sample, the adsorbent. And physical adsorption occurs through interaction of weak forces of attraction, such as van der Waals forces. They are of low enthalpy, typically lower than 50 kilojoules per mole, and importantly they don't involve the formation of chemical bonds. And the most common adsorbate is nitrogen. And nitrogen is adsorbed at 77 Kelvin, so liquid nitrogen temperature. So in this case, we're actually referring to the adsorption of the liquid phase rather than the gaseous phase. Now this isotherm on screen at the moment is of a zeolite sample, and the adsorption isotherm is shown in red, and the desorption isotherm is shown in blue. When we're collecting full isotherms, it's actually very common to also measure the desorption isotherm, and that's really important as it can give us a lot of information, not just on the pore size, but also the shape of the pores present within the sample. We will follow the progression of a gas absorption analysis, and we'll use the model isotherm we've just looked at. But in this image, we've drawn a simplified two-dimensional representation of a sample showing the solid portion of the sample in blue. And we've also put three pores into this sample. A micropore is the smallest, a mesopore in the middle, and a macropore. Now these size ranges, shown over on the right-hand side, are according to the IUPAC classification of pore sizes. There are various others about, but this is the most common. And the dimensions refer to the diameter of a cylindrically shaped pore, or the width of a slit-shaped pore. It's also becoming more and more common to refer to the very smallest pores, and that's pores smaller than one nanometer diameter or width, as super micropores or ultra micropores. And their influence to applications such as filtration, adsorbent materials, catalysis, battery electrodes, is becoming realized more and more. And we also now have the instrumentation and the pore modeling software to investigate them in really quite fine detail. Now it's quite important to note finally that not all samples have micropores, mesopores and macropores present and the shape of the isotherm will change quite dramatically depending on the pore sizes and the pore shapes actually present. But we'll go on to consider that a little bit later. At the start of the analysis we will already have thoroughly degassed our sample and this is to clean it through the removal of moisture or any other extraneous materials that are present and it's absolutely vital that we do this. The sample would have been placed into an analysis tube and then fitted to our analyzer and at MCA services we've got two gas adsorption analyzers uh, both by, manufactured by Micromeritics, um, a TriStar and a ThreeFlex instrument. Now, since this is the start of the analysis, there's no data on the isotherm plot yet. Instead, the sample is being held under vacuum, waiting for gas to be admitted to the analysis tube, in this case nitrogen. We are now going to show what will happen as we start to dose gas, and we do that to predetermine relative pressures. And at each pressure, the complete adsorption of nitrogen will be allowed to reach a steady state, a process called equilibration, and the volume at each pressure we're trying to measure 
will be recorded. As nitrogen is dosed into the analysis tube, atoms will first adsorb to the surface of the sample and also to the walls of the larger pores and will fill any micropores that are present. The smallest pores always fill with adsorbate first and micropores will be completely filled at really quite a low relative pressure. The presence of micropores is strongly indicated by the near vertical adsorption isotherm at the very lowest pressures analysed and we can see this here on the left hand side of the isotherm plot. In the representation of our sample, nitrogen is shown as red spheres and we can see that the isotherm, to a point roughly corresponding to this stage, is shown as the red line on the plot below. Note that the x-axis scale is shown as relative pressure, and this is quite normal for gas adsorption isotherms. It's the absolute pressure dosed to the sample analysis tube relative to the saturation vapour pressure of the adsorbate. And in the case of nitrogen, the saturation vapour pressure will be measured as part of the analysis and will tend to be slightly higher than atmospheric pressure. As relative pressure increases, the adsorbate will continue to cover the external surface and also the walls of the meso and macropores with a single layer of atoms. This complete coverage in a layer of adsorbate, just one atom thick, is called the monolayer and it's the volume of this that we are trying to establish when calculating surface area. For many samples, the monolayer is formed in, within the approximate range 0.05 to 0.35 relative pressure. But this doesn't mean that this range always applies, and we have to assess it for every individual analysis. Some samples, particularly microporous samples, will have the monolayer range towards the, the lower limit of this, or even outside of it, but we'll cover that in another video. The formation of a distinct monolayer is part of adsorption theory, but in reality it's actually doubtful whether it forms. The great majority of samples do not present the adsorbate with a homogeneous surface. There will be some adsorption sites that are energetically more attractive than others. And since the enthalpy of this adsorption is low, atoms are free to desorb and readsorb on another site as the process continues. A process of multilayer adsorption, so that's, that would be nitrogen on nitrogen in this case, may also start before the complete formation of the monolayer. So we're actually establishing a region of the isotherm in which statistically the volume adsorbed corresponds to just the complete monolayer. As we continue to increase relative pressure, we start to see multilayer adsorption occurring. Now that's adsorption, in this case, of nitrogen on nitrogen, building up successive layers, and this occurs on the surface of the material, and also within the, the larger pores, the mesopores and the macropores. Now to differentiate between the monolayer and the, the multilayer, we're showing the multilayer adsorption as green spheres now. And this also corresponds to the slight increase in the adsorption isotherm that we can see on the plot below. As we continue towards saturation pressure, now we can get quite close to it but not actually attain saturation vapour pressure, adsorption will continue to fill the mesopores and smaller macropores. This is shown in, by the increase in adsorption volume of the isotherm starting at around about 0.8 relative pressure. Close to saturation, the mesopore in our diagram has become completely filled with adsorbate, while the larger macropore remains only partially filled. The size limit to which pores are completely filled at, towards saturation depends on a number of things, but we can usually get useful data on pores up to around about 300 nanometers in diameter. Once we've collected the adsorption data, we can repeat the process in reverse, lowering relative pressure and recording the volume of the adsorbate as it's desorbed. The desorption branch of an isotherm is shown here in blue. And we can see that there's hysteresis between the adsorption and the desorption branches. And this is really very useful when we try to determine the shape of the pores present in the sample. Isotherms tend to be classified by the BDDT system. And that's named after its creators, Brunauer, Deming, Deming and Teller. There's a total of six classifications, all based on the shape of the adsorption isotherm. And there's further classifications based on the shape of desorption hysteresis, but we'll leave that for another video. 
In this example, we have a type 1 isotherm, and this is for nitrogen sorption to an activated carbon. We can see that it's entirely microporous, and this is because we have the vertical adsorption isotherm up to a relative pressure of 0.002, so very, very low relative pressures, and that's followed by the the curve across to a flat isotherm. And the isotherm's flat from pretty much 0.2 relative pressure upwards. There's a lack of desorption hysteresis. The desorption isotherm in blue lays on top of the adsorption isotherm. So mesoporosity and macroporosity are pretty much absent from this material. Now we use the Micromeretics 3-flex instrument for this analysis as it allows us to collect lots and lots of very low relative pressure data. We can also apply a suitable pore model to determine the micropore size distribution. This is shown on the right hand side and this is a micropore size distribution plot generated using NLDFT, so that's non-localized density functional theory, and basing it on a slit shaped pore model for, for an activated carbon. We can see that we have a bimodal pore size distribution and there's extensive super microporosity. It's a pore smaller than one nanometer being present. Using this technique, we can not just determine the uh, micropore size distribution, but also the volume of the micropores and the area. And this is quite often very fundamentally important to the performance and the efficiency of materials in a great many applications. This is an isotherm of a mesoporous silica alumina. Now the shape of the isotherm is really quite different from the type 1 isotherm we just saw, and this is classified as a type 4 isotherm. There's a complete lack of microporosity, but instead there's an increase in adsorption volume starting at around about 0.65 relative pressure, and that reaches a plateau as the isotherm approaches saturation. There's also very distinct hysteresis between the adsorption and the desorption isotherms. Now there's several pieces of information that we can readily gain from this isotherm and we're going to start by looking at the lower relative pressure portion of the adsorption isotherm. From this we can calculate the BET surface area of the material. And we're going to cover this in much more detail in another video but we can see the BET transform plot on the right and the relative pressure range applied to it is 0.05 to 0.30. This provides us with a BET transform plot of excellent linearity and a positive intercept with the y-axis. The BET surface area for this particular sample is calculated to be 217 square metres per gram. From the full isotherm, and we're going to stick here with the silica alumina type 4 isotherm, we can obtain quite a simple measurement of total pore volume. At the highest adsorption relative pressure of 0.99, we can see that 399 cubic centimetres of nitrogen have been adsorbed per gram of sample. And this, when converted to a liquid volume, gives a total pore volume of 0.609 cubic centimetres per gram of sample. So essentially, this is telling us that the volume of open pores within the sample is 0.609 cubic centimetres per gram of sample. But we also need to be careful, we need to consider the 0.99 relative pressure correlates to pores of approximately 180 nanometers diameter. So more accurately, the volume of open pores smaller than 180 nanometers diameter is 0.609 cubic centimeters per gram of sample. This is just one measurement of pore volume. It's also possible through various other models to determine pore volume in certain pore size ranges. For example, micropore volume can be calculated through the DFT method we saw previously, or through other methods such as T-plots, Dubinin plots, or horvath kawazoe Alternatively, mesopore and macropore volumes can be obtained through application of the BJH models, and we'll come on to consider them next. Moving to the higher relative pressure end of the isotherm, we can obtain mesopore size, volume, and area information. In fact, this can also be extended into the macropore range as well, but this particular sample has a well-ordered, distinctly mesoporous pore structure. In this slide, we have applied the BJH model to the adsorption isotherm. Like many models and methods in gas adsorption, this is again named after its creators, Barrett, Joyner and Hollander. 
The plot on the left shows the pore size distribution according to pore volume. The sample is distinctly mesoporous, with pores in the range of 3 to 35 nanometers diameter, and the peak maximum occurring at 12 nanometers. The plot on the right shows the pore area distribution. The plots look really quite similar, but the pore area plot does show a greater skew towards smaller pores, which is reasonable since for a given pore volume, smaller pores will contribute more to total pore area than larger pores. Which representation is relevant will depend largely on the intended application of the sample being analysed, and in addition to these plots it's also usual to report the pore volume and pore area as numerical values as well, together with the average pore size. The pore size distribution is just as important as the average values though. So thank you for watching this presentation. It's intended to give a, a quick overview of gas adsorption analyses and show the information on pore structures that can be gained from them. And we'll be adding to this over time to go into more detail for each of the different sections.